The crew has become somewhat of a modern racing anomaly. Within the past few console generations, big budget AAA racing franchises have slimmed so only a handful remain. The original The Crew was by no means a perfect game, but I've always admired its goal to show up on the scene and be something different. And unlike most racers at the time, it had edge to it, something that these days has vanished in its entirety. Ubisoft's massive open world racer grabbed its spotlight and performed well enough to justify a sequel. 2018 brought us The Crew 2. Gone was the gritty, edgy tone, and in its place, a new identity. The Crew 2 is a far more divisive title than the first. Radically different atmosphere, setup, vehicles, and a focus on freedom. Well, that always ends well now, doesn't it? The Crew 2 has gone through many phases since launch, and while the current day racing YouTube sphere likes to imagine you have the IQ and memory of a four-year-old and pretend The Crew 2 is some brand new thing and that you can't believe this game is an FH5, I'd prefer to treat both you and The Crew 2 with a little more respect and give the game the retrospective it deserves with Motorfest on the way. And without any further ado, let's dive on into the complicated yet oh-so-enthralling reality of The Crew 2. The four years in between the original The Crew and The Crew 2 drove the fan base and direction of racing games into a wildly different direction than we've ever seen before, with many repercussions of this trend still well and alive today. So what exactly was this difference, and why are these games in the same series so unrecognizably different? To help showcase this, I'll pass you off to a very special guest. Take it away, Mitch. I'd like to talk about the differences between The Crew and The Crew 2, but before I can do that, I need to define the terms illegal street racing and festival street racing. Are these self-defining terms? Yes, but humor me. Illegal street racing games are characterized by unsanctioned races on public roads, usually in urban environments, and often emphasizing both the illegality and the thrill of the racing. In contrast, festival racing games feature organized racing events, employing a legal and professional car enthusiast aesthetic. Illegal street racing games dominated the aughts and early part of the 2010s, led by franchises like Need for Speed and Midnight Club. Whereas over the last decade, festival racers have replaced illegal street racing games as the genre du jour, largely carried by the Forza series. Between The Crew and The Crew 2, we see the same shift, meaning as the franchise currently stands, it can be viewed as a microcosm of the racing genre at large. While there are certainly festival style aspects to the game, the crew primarily aligns with the illegal street racing archetype. There are unsanctioned racing events, high-speed police chases, and a narrative centered around taking down a criminal underworld from within. The user experience is largely built around evoking a sense of illegality, with tasks up to and including performing hits on rival gangsters. It should come as no surprise that reviewers often likened the crew to the Need for Speed series, with the former being very much cut from the latter's cloth. The crew was a welcome addition to the illegal street racing subgenre. In stark contrast to its predecessor, The Crew 2 represented a clear pivot towards the festival style. The storyline of the sequel revolved not around a criminal underworld, but a fame-based progression system with players seeking to build their fanbase in the world of professional motorsports. The races in The Crew 2 were not secret illegal affairs, rather they were spectated fully sanctioned events. This festival aesthetic could be seen everywhere in the game, from the bright, colorful visuals to the in-game social media aspects that reflect a more mainstream, accessible view of car culture. Further supporting this shift was the conspicuous absence of law enforcement, with police chases entirely missing from the game. Even the driving physics veered towards the realistic simulation style, characteristic of festival racing games like Forza. This stylistic shift demonstrated a clear departure from the illegal street racing narrative of the crew, aligning the crew to more closely with the festival racing subgenre. The implications of the tonal shift between the games are profound. Firstly, the transition mirrors the changing winds in the racing game genre. It's difficult to avoid comparing The Crew 2 and, for example, Forza Horizon, and while the former does not match up qualitatively to the latter, it nonetheless embraces similar themes and mechanics, matching the broader pattern that we see in racing games. On one hand, this shift has its place, with many, if not most, fans preferring the race day atmosphere. On the other hand, this shift further drives a stake into the heart of the already in decline illegal street racing subgenre. More egregiously, this shift facilitated a move away from being a story based game and towards a game that focuses almost entirely on online gameplay. And because you aren't living under a rock, you recognize that that means excessive monetization. That's really my thesis here. You earn money for your boss. Your boss gives you a fraction of that money so you can survive. 
and the racing genre, the Crew 2 included, has been sterilized in an attempt to extract that money from you. In summary, the franchise's shift from illegal street racing to festival racing can be viewed as an example of the trend afflicting the genre as a whole. This transformation, spurred by a complex interplay of cultural trends and monetization strategies, has seen the genre steer from edgy, illegal street racing towards the brighter, more palatable world of festivals. The move towards festival racing has probably brought the genre to a broader audience, but I can't help but mourn the ongoing death of illegal street racing games. Regardless, as the racing genre further homogenizes, I look forward to seeing which factors individual games will use to set themselves apart in the space. So, in that spirit, I'm excited for the Crew Motorfest. Anyway, thank you Moses and Serp for giving me a captive audience. You can have your video back. The Crew 2's career is the most clear-cut showcase of my main issues with the game as a whole. A fantastic concept that ended up plain or underbaked. There's an old saying to never trust a restaurant with a big menu, and the Crew 2 has far too many dishes, most of them being forgettable. Sure, you'll probably find a few things you'll like, but nothing really gets the chance to steal the show and really wow you. Four different categories with 16 total different racing disciplines. The scale of it all would take monumental skill and organization to make all of those categories feel good, but that's just not the case. The Crew 2 leaves everything up to you, the single largest issue with the modern open world racing game. Once you're past the first 10-15 minutes of the Crew 2, the entirety of the game's crew mode is just up to you. There's no real solid end goal here, it's pick and choose which adventure you'd like to experience and when. The original crew had not only an actual story behind it, but structure in narrative and game design, having you travel across America city by city working towards something. The crew too has no real story. Knockoff Forza Horizon Festival wants you to have fun and do races for the followers, yo. One event will be in Vegas, the next in New York leading to constant fast traveling and jumping all across this ginormous map, directly defeating the point of even having it in the first place. The solution to all of this is so painfully simple, yet for the sake of this ever so important freedom the modern racer must provide, Ubisoft chose to follow the Horizon branded sheep. For the sake of example, if the Crew 2 did something as simple as just having each group be hosted in four quarters of the map, having street racing to the west coast, where you ditch the fast travel, drive across the western United States doing events, and learning the stories of the cities, eventually culminating in the completion of the street racing arc. Then moving on to your choice of the next discipline in one of the next three sections of the map. You still have player agency in what you want to do next, but it isn't aimless. What we ended up with is this beautifully large map, the only one of its kind in the whole genre, which is just a host of fast travelable gates to start the next event in this sliver of the map. The Crew 2 does have great ideas, the introduction showing off the literal bending of the world, and vehicle switching between race to race was truly a brilliant demonstration of the technology on offer here. It's just that the Crew 2 doesn't even dare considering the player to learn a mechanic that they might not want to use, so what's the point of even having it in the first place? Why not just have air, land, and sea races just be their own thing without the switching mechanic? I mean that's basically what we ended up with anyways. Games like Driver San Francisco took a mechanic just as simple in concept as the Crew 2 switching and forced you the player to use it to your advantage and made it a core element of narrative, gameplay, and the whole project's identity. And guess what happened? People loved it. And the same would apply if the Crew 2 followed this as well. But alas, a lack of player agency and purpose to actually use this feature, again, makes you wonder why would you even include it in the first place. It's a strange phenomenon that seems to me to only really appear in racing games. Any other genre encourages players learning unique mechanics, whether that be for combat, exploration, or even something narrative related, whatever it may be. Yet asking the racing game player to open their minds seems like blasphemy in the modern day. Freedom is the killer of game design. It's why people like myself have grown so tired of the modern racing game format. Open world, tons of cars, one or two event types, and it's all up to you to choose in what order you want to do everything, if you even want to do it at all. A game like this isn't the end of the world, but when every game on the market starts to follow this exact same formula, it's important to call things out before the only differentiator between these games is the name on the cover. Oh. Okay.
Okay, let's slow down for a second. Let's play devil's advocate here and throw a little more light on the Crew 2's campaign. While it may not truly master each vehicle discipline, this is the only racing game in existence where you can spend one race plunging hypercars down the streets of Manhattan, launch dragsters down the Vegas Strip the next, and then go on to an aerobatic stunt performance, powerboat sprint, or even do some motocross. With this much on offer, it's near impossible to find something you want to have a good time with. Let's stick to the land first. Street and Hyper are your standard bread and butter races you'll find in most games, though it is a great touch that you can race cars and bikes against each other, which has been exclusive to the crew since, say, PGR4 on the 360. Not many games let you make this choice, and thankfully it is one that actually carries some weight. Bikes are faster in the straights, but far less effective in the corners, yet counteract that with the ability to fit in gaps cars could never. Cars are both faster in the corners and take far less skill to master, so picking your poison has meaning. The only issue I really have with these disciplines is Hyper, which used to differentiate itself by having at least a 10 minute long race and have a stronger focus on really going the distance, though slowly more shorter races were added, making them just faster street races. Drift events are fine, the cars ditch the Crew 2's normal fake traction control and put so much weight on the back end Nicki Minaj would get jealous. Mechanically, drift events are held back because they're just plain too easy. All you have to do is not hit any walls, rack up a massive chain and you'll demolish the objective. Drifting isn't really a part of the, um, drift discipline. Drag is the last of our street disciplines, and it's honestly not too much better than drift. All you have to do is warm your tires, accelerate when the light goes green, and then shift against ghost times. If this took place on purpose-built drag tracks against actual opponents, it could prove for a pretty interesting addition to the game. But in the end, there's not much cool about it apart from going 400 miles an hour, which in the end is near nullified by the Crew 2's sense of speed anyways. For those looking to get serious, we have Pro Racing, which is host to some of the best and most fine disciplines in the game. Touring cars are the biggest missed opportunity here. This is closed circuit racing with actual track built cars, but the reality is you just feel like you're driving hypercars which aren't quite as quick and handle marginally better. It's a fine discipline but nothing special at all. It also doesn't help that almost every track has this same blue aesthetic making them all blend together. Alpha GP huh? Don't kid yourself, this is just Formula 1. With a whopping two cars at launch, this has been expanded to have a much more acceptable list of newer F1 cars, concept open wheelers, and uh, KTM Expo? Uh, what? Weird car choices aside, this discipline is actually a lot of fun. These genuinely feel like track monsters unlike the touring cars, and you really can't be ripping F1 cars down the Pacific Coast Highway now can you? Air Race is the first non-land based discipline on our list, and it's pretty alright. A mix of time trials and precision flying, making it actually pretty challenging but rewarding when your precision cuts down your time like crazy. This single discipline almost makes planes worthwhile to me. Power boats are the single reason people hate boats and planes in the crew too. This was very clearly an afterthought, and accented by the appallingly poor physics and zero interesting mechanics. Who knew lugging around massive boats on unpredictable water just isn't very fun? You've also got a plethora of options when you're looking to get dirty. The first and most basic of which being Rally Raid. Rally Raid is your typical off-road discipline, but watered down severely. There are no races here, or opponents even, just set times to beat which are mind-numbingly generous. Rally Raid doesn't necessarily do much wrong, but it barely does anything to begin with. A shame considering how badass the Rally Raid concept is. Motocross is the most fun you can have in the Crew 2 by far, is what I would have said a year ago before they ruined the physics and made the bikes feel like the rotation points got jammed and cut the consistency of acceleration as well. The bikes used to have this crazy floatiness that made this discipline super fun to race. There's sparks of that that still remain, but alas, out of the many great changes to physics over the years, Motocross was an unfortunate downgrade. Rest in peace motocross, lost but not forgotten. Rallycross is your typical rally style that every game under the sun needs today. It's like street race, but on dirt trails now. Thankfully there are some neat mechanics like joker laps and they created some pretty good rally tracks and proper slidey physics, making this one of the better disciplines to play, but again lacking that real wow factor that you get from actual rally games. I know I'm alone on this and I will die on this hill. Hovercraft is about as fun as you can get in the crew too and easily the best off-road discipline. The extreme handling of the crafts, which basically feel like drift cars set on top of nitrous powered beanbags, makes you really think about how to tackle each turn. Plus the crafts being able to go on land and water can make for some pretty innovative track design. 
Though this discipline was hated on release because your average racing game fans are crybabies, and the slightest notion of fundamental change sends them into cardiac arrest. The backlash for this discipline leads into the devs cancelling the planned helicopter discipline, which, gr great job, guys. <laughs> Freestyle is, if you ask me, the weakest of the four main hubs, and it's not even close. Monster Trucks. Cool, right? No. Somehow, no. Monster Truck is essentially you going around an arena picking up points. Uh, people buy a racing game too. Uh, I don't know. Race. Dropping them into arena and going, have fun lol, is truly a waste of development time and just plain lazy decision making from the directive team. At least they kind of salvaged this one by making some actual race events later in the game's life cycle, but by that point it's just Rally Raid 2, Fiat 500, Boogaloo. Jet sprints are a second and final boat discipline. Thankfully, this one's not catastrophically bad. The boats are decent to control and respond much better than the lethargic power boats, but this time it's the track design that brings this concept down. The boats are about as light as fruit, so any tiny jaggered edge or slight bit of land can make the boats flip and lose control, which can kill a run. But, if you can get the hang of it and master each track, that can kind of lead into the fun, intentional or not. Demolition Derby is the only other post-launch discipline, and this one's… not good. It really is a great and creative concept, and it's fun at first, but starts to fall flat when you realize the AI are targeting you specifically, and everything is decided by who gets the ram power up. The races are again bogged down as the cars aren't meant to be used for actual racing. It's one of the most promising disciplines, and at the same time, one of the largest wastes of potential. And speaking of, we get to the largest waste in the entire game. Aerobatics. Getting a checklist of random shit to do in a plane isn't fun. Points aren't fun. This discipline isn't fun. How on earth do you make one of the most spectacular things you can do with airplanes nothing more than a glorified tutorial? So out of the 16 different disciplines here, how many have been good? Maybe four. With the rest being plain average and serviceable to complete and utter travesties. It all circles back to that menu example. If the crew too had a nice small menu and put the time into making each dish stand out and wow the player, this could have been fantastic. Disciplines aside, in the end there is so much on offer, and the crew 2's campaign seriously would have benefited from some good structure, as what we ended up with, while fun at times, it's all up to player agency which is about as lazy of a career as you can get. There is again also the issue with the vehicle switching mechanic being virtually non-existent throughout the whole thing, spare for very few events. The crew too took some ambitious steps, but was too afraid to keep walking. Which is a shame because if a little more time was spent organizing and adding into this experience, it could have been truly fantastic. With a game as varied and hit or miss as many of the crew 2's aspects, the way vehicles were handled is even more of a double-edged sword. Let's handle the cars first as that's what the vast majority of the player base and the game itself focus on. The car list itself is solid, taking the list from the first game, adding newer versions of cars without deleting the old ones, and keeping itself up to date with the modern car world. It may not be the biggest list on the planet, but it doesn't have a lot of misses, and fills those slots with cars nothing else has. Cars like the Chiron Supersport 300 Plus, Koenigsegg Gamera, Bentley Moliner Bacalar, Mercedes SLR McLaren 722, parked alongside some truly special concepts like the Lamborghini Egoista and Citroen GT. Ivory Tower even designed a few vehicles of their own from scratch, and some of them truly are drop dead stunning. All of these cars can be picked up and test driven at their respective hubs, which is where the Crew 2's most common complaint comes up the handling. The Crew 2 is by far the most arcade focused of the big name racing titles, leading cars to feel very floaty and boaty, not always in a bad way. When you're in the rhythm and get past the initial learning curve, it's nowhere near as bad as it's made out to be. After all, games like Test Drive Unlimited weren't exactly brilliant in the physics department, but well, we all know how I feel about those games. Time has teated the crew 2's handling with the respect it deserves, the game being boosted to 60 frames per second post-launch, alongside various slow tweaks over time, have led to a much more cohesive and stable physics model than at launch. While it may not be for everyone, I for one 
everyone can respect that it does take some time to get used to. Learning the physics and slowly building confidence with this unique model can be a lot of fun, though there are some flaws that practice won't fix completely. High speed twitchiness, a lack of front and rear end companionship being the most prominent of which. Getting sideways is hard in the career too, as your back end simulates traction control and gains fake weight at the back. This is mostly unintrusive unless you get a bit over ambitious in the real high speed stuff, in which case the physics model can't comprehend how to fix the situation and correcting what went wrong is you against a system that is very much not designed for the worst case scenario. Something that is commendable, however, is the Crew 2's handling of off-road versus on-road cars. Take a hypercar off-road where it shouldn't be and you slow down to a halt, and steering becomes very challenging. Something competitors need to take a note of, not mentioning any names. Forza. There are a few other things in the vein of cars which are in need of serious improvement. The Crew 2 has definitively the worst sense of speed in decades. I'll blur out the speedo here so you can guess how fast this Chiron Supersport is moving. Take a second and yeah, that is truly awful. <laughs> The sound files are also super hit or miss. Granted, this is no sim, and I'm not asking for the most accurate sound files, just ones that don't sound like they've been compressed within half an inch of their life and have a little more character to them. This all being said, there is one thing the crew too does very well, and that's celebrate a good connection between yourself, the player, and your car. A little bit of that TDU DNA remains at your apartment. It's a shame that you can't buy multiple houses and there is nowhere near as much customizability with the Crew 2's apartments. But with that being said, this is the only racing game in the modern day where you can walk around and admire your vehicles, go outside on the deck and take a look at the city, and view your game so far all from the perspective of your character model. Unlike the old Test Drive Unlimited formula, however, you can upgrade, paint, and customize them all on the spot seamlessly in your apartment, which again, no other competitor can compete with. Customization and upgrades themselves is another doozy that the Crew 2 does both shockingly well and so poor it makes you wonder how any of this got approved. Let's get the good over with first. Customization is fantastic, both for those with tastes such as myself who prefer to take a more purist approach, with plenty of bumper, wheel, headlight, and trim options from each individual manufacturer. Again, one of the most criminally missed feature in every other AAA racer. If you like to get a little more, uh, zany, the Crew 2's homegrown hundreds of body parts and kits are sure to put a smile on your face. Or not. The Summit cars and over-the-top tire smoke, neon underglows, and I can't believe it's not AutoZone stick on bits and bobs are certainly an acquired taste. But let's just be thankful they aren't unnecessary. Interior customization is another massive feature fully exclusive to the crew. Of the hundreds of cars available, all of them, spare for a few understandable exceptions, allow the privilege of changing interior color tones, placement, materials, and choice of trim. This is all highlighted by the ability to move your camera all throughout the interior of the car, admiring your work while driving. Forza might have the most cars. Need for Speed might have the most ridiculous kits, but in terms of admiring and making your car part of your journey, there isn't many a racer on sale today that makes you build this much of a connection with your cars. That all is until you have to upgrade them. For the most part, upgrading the performance of your car should be pretty straightforward. The bigger the number of the part, the better it should be. Pretty common sense stuff, I think most people should be able to grasp that. The issue is that you can't just buy parts, you win them. And because the Crew 2's parts all have unique attributes to each and every one, things easily get far too complex. Green parts are common, rares blue, epics are red, legendaries are yellow. And each of these rarities have their own cluster of skills to add on to that called the fixes. These will give boosts to specific ways of driving, general stat boosts, or sometimes higher payouts. What makes a fixes confusing though is you can't just choose what perks you want. You must either get lucky with the part you want, or pay not just money, but another new currency you get through scapping old parts you don't want just to be able to get perks you do want. All for a single brake part. Keep in mind you have seven different slot parts on every vehicle, and if you like collecting and upgrading cards, this not only gets excruciatingly annoying, but bloody expensive. If you're looking to get involved in leaderboards, summit challenges, or anything involving performance, it's all really a contest of who's got the best parts to get an advantage. In retrospect though, with the knowledge that the Crew Motorfest will be ditching the system for one more like the original game, it's quite silly that this game of all of them has such a complex and convoluted upgrade system, considering how simple the meat of the game itself is. But nonetheless, you live and learn. And if the Crew Motorfest can fix this alongside the aforementioned physics mishaps, we have a commendable game to look forward to. Before moving on though, there is a side tangent I want to bring up, and that's money. 
I don't know where people are getting the, this game is a massive grind from because it doesn't throw cards at you like Forza. The crew asks that if you want something, you gotta play the game for it. Crazy concept, right? And in return for doing so, you get a sense of accomplishment and connection after spending an hour or two working for that cheer on super sport that you've wanted. It wasn't given to you from some wheel spin you happen to get after racing for three minutes. No, you earned it because you worked for it. And it's one of very few racing games these days that still give you that feeling. Choosing to go open world makes or breaks a racing game. After all, how you choose to set up your world defines the basis for the game itself. And if that foundation in itself is flawed, there's not much you can do to save your game. The original crew wasn't a trailblazer with its massive rendition of America, with games like Test Drive Unlimited existing beforehand. Though the series remains the only current game in the market to carry that formula on in spirit. While the competition focuses on having the most excruciatingly detailed cactuses and little villages in the corner you're never gonna look twice at, I've always been a fan of scale in an open world especially one designed for driving. The Crew 2's America is truly massive. It'll take you a good 30 minutes to head east to west, with the whole thing scaling over 5,000 square kilometers. For context, Forza Horizon 5 has a map size of 107 square kilometers. So yeah, it's bigger. But is that really better? The age-old argument is detail versus scale, and on this front, the Crew 2 is nowhere near as true to life or culturally accurate as many others. But does that really matter? This is, after all, a racing game. If you ask me, stopping to analyze the accuracy of shrubbery doesn't take priority over the feeling of exploration and finding new roads and sight pieces, something that in the smaller maps of the competition is over and done with quick, so you're back to appreciating your favorite shrubbery faster than ever. The crew too would take genuine years of exploration to find every nook and cranny, and that isn't the only good thing. Variation in environment and weather is staggering. You've got seven of the United States major cities, each with their own sense of identity and character. And then we have the whole of the United States geography to show off. The Pacific Northwest's gorgeous mountains, trees and elevation, Miami's beachy blue eye candy, the Las Vegas Strip, and uh, Eureka? That isn't to mention the basically endless roads, both paved and unpaved, which bring into question another very important tool that the Crew 2 uses, barriers. You might be wondering, what on earth am I talking about? But yes, barriers, both physical manifestations of barriers and clever game design tricks. The Crew 2 prevents you from cutting through fields and hypercars and making a joke of its road design <coughs> by creating well-designed roads and then making you use them. What a radical concept using road cars on road and saving the dirty stuff when it has a purpose to serve. Like we said earlier, taking a hypercar off-road results in a truly unsettling and unnatural experience, as it should be. Ivory Tower respects the player base's ability to stay on the roads and, you know, drive, not cut through empty fields like its World War III series. It's a remnant of that TDU DNA that still resided within the dev team, and not the only example of it. Replicas of real-life racetracks are placed inside the map without any loading screens or complications, just show up and go wild. Now, they can be a little vertically challenged at times, Laguna Seca feeling a bit deflated, but it's better to have flat tracks than no tracks in my books. This monolithic giant of a map is also host to some pretty clever Ubisoft lighting and weather tech, resulting in very few scenic drives ever looking the same. Some cloudy, rainy, bright and sunny, and occasionally bringing proper snow down. The world follows a similar system to Forza Horizon Post 4, in where you are always existing with other players, like my good friend Monkey Squirt 578 Yet due to having so much more map on offer, and having important locations spread out, you don't run constantly into dealing with other players. Now then, we've looked at the Crew 2's career, gameplay, vehicles, customization, map, all of that in which defined the Crew 2 upon release. But there's one more thing that makes it special, how time has treated the project. The realm of post-launch content has become a necessary evil for the better part of a decade now, and the Crew 2 is one of very few that I believe handled the concept with both respect and creativity. For the past five years, every three months means a drop of new content. The Crew 2's growth is largely due to these updates, and in the hopes of showing off Ivory Tower's tremendous efforts and how the game changed over time, we wanted to go over how each of these updates changed the game. It'll be a lot of DLC talk, so if you want to skip to the next chapter, boom. The Crew 2 launched in a pretty usual state, with about 300 cars, 14 disciplines, and no PvP at launch, which was a surprisingly common trend at the time. The Crew 2 was pretty barren when it first came out, so it relied on a slew of updates to make the game a lot better. And boy, was there a lot. First of which was Gator Rush. Releasing in late 2018, Gator Rush added a 15th discipline. 
Hovercraft. This update also added the Ace difficulty mode, which was fantastic for grinders, as well as adding a few new cars like the Aerial Nomad and all the new hovercrafts. So overall, a pretty solid first update. King of Mayhem. Releasing around Christmas 2018 gave us our 16th and final discipline, Demolition Derby. It also added in a lot more new cars like the Bugatti Chiron, Ferrari A12 and the 4 GT Le Mans. It also introduced three new level reward cars, with the Chiron Carbon Edition being the penultimate reward at level 1000. The Carbon Edition was the first of the Edition type cars, which are variations of cars already in the game with slightly different stats and pre-built modifications. This update also finally included a PvP mode, which was actually pretty good. Seriously, keep everyone ghosted the entire race needs to be normalized if Forza has anything to go by. We also got live contracts in the update, which was an in-game way to earn crew credits, which they later removed for inexplicable reasons. Other than the lacking discipline, this was a really good update that introduced a lot and is still a part of the Crew 2's DNA to this day. Hot Shots. This update changed the Crew 2 forever. Dropping mid-2019, this update gave us the live summits, weekly challenges to compete with players globally for exclusive rewards. These are still the Crew 2's strong suit to this day. The live summits are a draw because the devs can pump out as many special editions of existing cars for players to come back and try and get. Something Need for Speed Unbound has now shamelessly ripped off and charges you for. Other than that, this update added a few new cars like the Bugatti Devo's debut in a proper racing game, the C7 Corvette ZR1, the 488 Pista, Lamborghini Egoista, and the introduction of Mitsubishi. Hotshots also introduced vanity items, which are both really cool in some parts and cursed as all hell in others. This update was by far the most crucial to the Crew 2's current lifespan, as we would not be where we are now without it. Blazing Shots, not to be confused with the previous update of a similar name. Releasing late 2019, this update wasn't anything crazy formulaic. Mostly the addition of heavily requested cars like the Porsche Carrera GT, Bugatti Veyron, 599XX, Mazda RX-8 My Beloved, and even the previously exclusive Citroen GT concept. These cards aside, this just added more summits and vanity items, a trend we'll see with more future updates to come. Inner Drive, the Crew 2's most infamous update. Releasing early 2020, it added more fan-requested cars like the Enzo, Diablo, and Eclipse, as well as being the Yesco's debut in a proper racing game. Inner Drive also added the single most painful thing to do in this game, the Hobbies activity. Hobbies were supposedly small challenges you could progress to earn rewards, but in reality, they were a huge grind fest, with three exclusive locked cars behind them, those being the Plymouth Roadrunner, Hummer HX Concept, and especially the FC RX-7, which still remain as some of the rarest cars in the game to this date. But that wasn't all this update added. This was when the infamous Eclipse Star Edition was added, a limited time paid only car for $10. This sent outrage in the community, and this was even more profound when the following week, they released another, the Shelby G2500 Road Force Edition. A car based on representing American freedom, being locked behind a $10 paywall. Ironic. The backlash was so bad, they removed it in near hours after it was put onto the store, and later released it as a summit reward, for a while making it the single rarest car in the Crew 2 history. Thankfully, the devs have learned their lesson and haven't released a limited time paid car ever since. Summer in Hollywood, the final of the Crew 2's more mainstream updates releasing mid-2020. This added many fan-requested cars like the Porsche 992, Koenigsegg 1-1, one -one, Nissan R390, Ferrari Testarossa, and Volkswagen's Beetle and Bus. Plus being the first of this weird trend of adding the DeLorean to modern racing games. Looking at you again, Unbound. This update also started toying around with filters for specific race events. This update was more so here to lead into the brand new season style update that would follow, starting with The Chase. The first of the seasonal format, this turned the crew to into, well... The Fortnite, the seasonal structure, the new <coughs> battle pass. You can't say they didn't take inspiration. The draw of the first season were the new police events, which just amounted to ramming as many cars as you could within the allotted time. Not a crazy fun game mode, but not the worst thing ever. It was totally fine. This update was split into two waves, with the first being road focused and the second being off road focused. The first wave gave us fitting cars to the C8 Singray, BMW M8, and the exclusive Bugatti La Voiture Noir. Yes, I know I butchered it, but I can't afford the car anyway, so who really cares? Funnily enough, this later on became the game's cover car. The second half introduced cars like the Jeep Moab Concept, Ram TRX, Land Rover Defender, Porsche GT1, and Mitsubishi 3000 GT, each with their own battle pass. Not the best for a season, but totally passable. The Agency. This season looked super promising on release, 
with crazy Hot Wheels style obstacle courses for you cars to drive on. So waiting till release day to finally race on- uh oh, it's just another points mode. Well, game road ruin. <laughs> This again was split into two parts, with an on-road and off-road focus being split. The most important car of which being the Koenigsegg Gamera, which is still to this day the only game it's in. Oh, and of course, this season had two battle passes. US Speed Tour. Starting to see a little bit of a trend here. Two battle passes split into two parts. First being on-road, second being off-road. At least the events are pretty cool this time. A tour of America being split up into multiple time trials. Pretty basic, but still honestly quite fun. Notable cars in this update are the Bugatti EB110, Pontiac GTO, and Carrera RSR in the first half, with the Maserati Alfrey and the NA Miata being added in the second half. Otherwise, not a super noteworthy update. The Contractor is easily the worst season of the crew too. This didn't add any events, but instead taxi jobs with awful payouts, and yet they somehow still added an off-road version. At least the cars were pretty cool, like the Koenigs ACCR, Porsche 993 Carrera RS, Crown Vic, KTM GT4, and McLaren 720S Spider. Otherwise, yeah, this update was super unnoteworthy. American Legends, following up the worst season with the best. Again, this season added no new event types, but instead a hunt across the map for exclusive cars, using the giant map to its advantage. It's really quite fun getting tips on where to go next and trying to line it up with the in-game map, then take a big road trip rally with an exclusive car as a reward. We also got some really cool cars this update, like the McLaren Senna, Koenigsegg CC GT, and KTM GTX. Dominion Forsberg. This was another pretty damn solid update. We got a bunch of much better tracks added to the overworld, plus new events to race on them. We also got probably the best batch of new cars in this update, that being the Chiron 300+, Plus, Nissan R35 Nismo and 350Z, Mazda RX-3, Saline S7, and Lamborghini Reventon. This update also began to roll out a 60 FPS boost platform by platform, which was a massive improvement for everyone, making this the best season to date. Into the Storm is another really good update. This time we have a series of 10 events with absurd weather conditions like we've never seen before, with an exclusive car as a reward from cleaning it all. This update shows the capacity of what a modern racing game could be if it was given full love and passion, as these races were some of the best in the industry. We also got another wave of fantastic cars like the Porsche 928, Lamborghini Countach both old and new, and the McLaren 765 LT. These recent updates have expanded the crew too greatly, but are held back by feeling a bit more like a tech demo for the future rather than a full on game. But hey, at least that tech demo is damn good. US Speed Tour. This update has the unfortunate curse of sharing a name with the previous update, making it difficult to tell them apart. Though this was still a fantastic update, adding new city-based tracks and a massive sprawling track just to the left of Detroit, which is by far the best track in the game. We also got amazing new cars like the Maserati MC20, Evo 6, Porsche 917K, Cayenne Turbo GT, and Panamera S, along with a ton of concept of one cars. Now to the present day, during the recording of this video, American Legends, the final season before Motorfest, also shares its name with the previous season. This update brings back the previous American Legends hunting for cars across the map, and it's still just as good as back then. And surprisingly, totally out of nowhere, a whole ass track creator and updates to in-game menus and race previews. Seriously, there was no need to do that this late in the game cycle, but they did. That's, honestly, that's incredible. American Legends also includes some new cars like the Audi RS3, RS7, and Lancia Stratos, with more still yet to come in the future while we wait for the transition to Motorfest. All of this ingenuity from Ivory Tower doesn't just stop with the crew too, as looking towards Motorfest, things keep getting more interesting. Motorfest is, after all in its entirety, a new game, but Ivory Tower knows that its player base has been with the crew too for a very long time now and has built a connection with their cars and garages. And for the first time that I'm aware of in history, will allow players the option to import their entire garage from the crew too to Motorfest. This is fantastic on a level apart from the aforementioned to me as well. This really will be Ivory Tower proving, yeah, this game itself isn't the crew too. Import your cars, drive around, you'll feel the difference to the crew too. Something that if Forza allows you to do between Horizon 4 and 5, you'd be hard pressed to even feel like you're playing anything new. Motorfest is going to be huge for the racing game doubt that we've been under the past few years. It's shaking up the Crew 2's formula in ways that could have massive implications for the future of the series, though it's hard to fully believe in the hype until we finally get the game in our hands. In summary of the Crew 2, 
Is this the hidden unsung savior of the racing game? Not quite, but it sure as hell could have been. The endgame itself has so many truly great sparks of greatness, just let down by a lack of commitment to the concept. The Crew 2's most important task, however, could be one that we don't even know of yet. Testing the waters so that Motorfest can shine. It may be hard to see just exactly what Motorfest may bring yet, but you can count on us for an honest review and release. Until then, thank you all so very much for watching, and we'll see you all in the next one.